I would like to welcome you to the first uh, UTC Institute for Advanced Systems Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series for this year. We have uh, at least uh, three or four more scheduled. Um, today we are going to talk uh, here about undirected rigid formations are problematic. It's basically when agents have different models of each other, how things can really go haywire. Um, this is uh, our distinguished speaker today is uh, Stephen Morris from uh, Yale University. We know that he's uh, our neighbor from about 60 miles from us. Um, Steve is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. As you know, that uh, that's one of the things that we look for when we invite distinguished speakers. Uh, Steve got his BSE degree from Cornell University, MS degree from the University of Arizona, and a PhD degree from Purdue University. From 67 to 1970, he was associated with the Office of Control Theory and Application, called OCTA, at the NASA Electronics Research Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Since 1970, he has been with the Yale University, where he is presently the Dudley Professor of Engineering. His main interest is in systems theory, and he has done extensive research in network synthesis, optimal control, multivariable control, adaptive control, urban transportation, vision-based control, hybrid and nonlinear systems, sensor networks, and coordination control of large group of mobile autonomous agents. That's what he's mm -hmm. going to talk about. The last, last topic is, uh, is the subject for today's talk. He's a fellow of the IEEE, a fellow of the International Federation of Automatic Control, that's IFAC, a past distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Control System Society, and a co-recipient of the Society's 1993 and 2005 George S. Axelby Outstanding Paper Awards. He has twice received the uh, American Automatic Con Control Council's Best Paper Award and is a co-recipient of the Automatica Theory Methodology Prize. He is the 1999 recipient of the IEEE Technical Field Award for Control S Systems. He is the 2013 recipient of the American Automatic Control Council Richard E. Bellman Control Heritage Award. As you know, Steve was actually one of the keynote speakers of the last year's uh, workshop that we had. And uh, he basically gave us the status of uh, adaptive control. Today he's going to talk about how do things adapt when you have multiple, not necessarily coordinated set of agents. Okay, so this uh, topic has a bit of a history, and um, um, I thought maybe I'd spend a minute or two telling you about the history. Uh, first of all, this is about controlling formations of mobile autonomous agents, which could be mobile sensors, they could be uh, uninhabited air vehicles, uh, or vehicles underwater. Uh, it's about controlling groups of vehicles. And uh, it's a topic which I've been interested in since uh, the NSF provided mm -hmm. me with a uh, grant, large grant, with about five other people uh, about 15 years ago. And that got me going on this. So the first question is, uh, why study formations of mobile autonomous agents? You've seen the Ford Motor Company ad, then you may like the answer, why not? Uh, well, they're, first of all, they're fun to study, and uh, there are lots of practical reasons for studying formations. Uh, they provide an efficient way of moving large numbers, um, numbers of autonomous agents around uh, if you're moving them from one location to another. Um, another reason uh, is that it's one way of trying to deal with a hugely complicated problem of collision avoidance. Um, in any event, um, it, they are of interest to me. I've been studying them for a long time. So one of the things that you might know if you've looked into this literature at all is that, there, that one way of dealing with uh, formation control problems is to use what are called potential functions. So the idea 
is to give each agent or to think of each agent as uh, like a point mass or maybe even something more complicated and to apply um, um, the right word escapes me, I'll say, fictitious forces, which would be uh, some which would repel the agent from other agents and some would prevent it from going uh, too far away, forces of cohesion and so forth. Um, and in fact, there, there's been quite a bit of success with that kind of thing in the world of artificial life. Uh, those of you who saw, I think, Jurassic Park, for example, that kind of, oh, the Lion King. It is that kind of uh, tool was used in the animation. And in fact, the, the brains behind that was a guy named Craig Reynolds who won an Academy Award. Now, for the, for in the real world, the situation's more complicated. Using potential functions, potential functions act in order to do anything analytically with them. You have to, they have to act at a great distance. They're not really distributed. Uh, there's, there's a lot of literature on it, but if you look, if you bore down carefully on what people are doing, you realize that they are not really distributed controls. They're each control, uh, each agent may see, look locally, but they act, but the forces that are controlling the motion are really global. In other words, if I'm trying to keep my distance from Professor Liu, I'll apply a repulsive force, excuse me. That force won't just act on him, it'll act on the whole formation. So there's a little bit of sleight of hand in that kind of research. Another way of, another basic principle for dealing with uh, formations, but first I should show you the results of our research so far. We're, we're near the Long Island Sound, so we, we deal with formations. Show the hand, can't hear that. So this is, we worked hard on this. No, this is not right. I, that's, that's Craig Reynolds. You can find anything on the internet. I've, I, you know, I've played this in China. I've played it everywhere. Nobody knows what language it is. Not even the Chinese. Do you know what they're talking about? Like, see, he's, he's listening. <laughs> Can you tell what they're saying? Is it, is it, what language is it? Is it Ma it's not Mandarin, is it? Is it? Okay. All right. So that's to wake you up. <laughs> Perhaps. So here's another way to think about controlling a formation. First of all, in a form the basic idea of having agents in formation means that they're, they're moving through space and that the inter-agent distances don't change. That's sort of the basic concept. All the inter-agent distances remain constant. So one way to do that is to have every agent watch every other agent or communicate with other, every other agent. And that's a lot of communications and that's not very effective. So another way is to do something like is depicted in this picture where if you think of the dots as agents, agents look at only some other agents, but not all other agents. And one of the things they might try to do is to hold constant the distance between them and the agents they're looking at. So for example, um, this agent might be trying to hold this distance constant. Now, if all the agents are successful in doing this, and if there are enough maintenance links, if you want to call them that, uh, then the formation will retain its shape. And you say, well, what's the underlying mathematical concept which is being used here? And that concept is called rigidity, graph rigidity. It's an old idea. It goes back to people like Cayley and Maxwell, certainly used in the theory of structures when you build bridges. People are worried about building rigid structures. And the way to think about what rigidity is, sort of as a mathematic in this context, is Think of the, the points as being flexible joints, completely flexible joints, and think of the lines as being rigid bars. So you connect the rigid bars to the flexible joints, and you ask when you're done, can you deform the object you've just created? If you can deform it, it's not rigid. If you cannot deform it, it's rigid. 
Now, the various notions of rigidity, it's more, uh, issues are more subtle than that, but that's sort of the intuitive idea. And uh, that's the idea that we're going to exploit. There's a large literature, specialized but large literature, on so-called graph rigidity. Anyway, here's what it means to have a moving formation under rigidity control. Now, once one has settled the question of uh, what kind of a formation we want and uh, where there should be maintenance, these maintenance links, then there comes the question of who's going to actually be tasked with the job of maintaining those distances. And so uh, one way to specify that in, in, in pictorially is to put arrows on the graph and to stipulate that the arrows mean, for example, in this case, that agent one follows co-leader or controls the distance from uh, one to two. That means it's an arrow from one to two. Uh, agent one maintains also the, the distance uh, D12 and D23. So D12 and D23, think of those as target or t desired distances, and agent one's job is to maintain those distances. And if agent one does that and everybody else does that, and if one has a rigid uh, formation or framework, sometimes it's called, uh, then this maintains the formation. That's sort of the idea. <clears throat> Just how to devise controls which cause agents to carry out their task is challenging more challenging than you might think. Closed cycles, for example, can present problems because of misregistration of agents' positions. So that would be, uh, you can't see the arrow tips, but that's a closed cycle. You'll see that in a second. And you can imagine possibly the, each, each agent misread, misreads the position of its neighbors and the arrows accumulate as you go around. At least that's what a colleague speculated would happen a few years back. So here, so, so one of the things that we wanted to exploit, actually based on a discussion with uh, John Bailey, as a matter of fact, who speculated that you couldn't control such formations, so we decided we'd look hard at the simplest possible example. So there's a triangular formation. So let me say a few things about this. This is called directed control because the underlying graph is directed. There are, there's one-way streets. Um, and we have, let's suppose that we have target distances that we associate with the formation. And we label the three vertices, one, two, three. They represent agent positions. And let's suppose that we have uh, the triangle inequality holds, so we have a real triangle. And the question is, can this formation be maintained? Give it Say again? You're right. <laughs> You okay. <laughs> you're right. Bless them. You, at least just checking to see if everybody's listening. Now I know you are. <laughs> Thank you. That is definitely an error. <laughs> um, okay. So, so what have we done? We've specified uh, three target distances. But as you might figure out, there are two uh, different triangles with the same distances. They're congruent. That means you can get from, you can move from one to the other with translations, rotations, and reflections. But if you drop reflections, which is what formation control problems have to do, and you just have translations and rotations, you cannot get from one to the other. So let, uh, with that in mind, let's define the set of all target uh, triangles in the plane to be uh, those which are translation, rotate, uh, rotation equivalent to one or the other of these two triangles. And if you think about it, that is going to divide the plane into two connected set, disconnected sets. Let's also define, because I want to state some results, uh, what I'll call the collinear set. So this will be all formations in the plane within which all three agents are in a straight line. And let's define as the state space uh, the plane except for uh, I shouldn't say the plane, the, all formations except for those in which two different agents are on top of each other. You know, rule out those points. And the reason for that is, if any of you follow up on this, you'll pick up a paper where the control laws that are defined in the paper would, would fail to be well-defined if two agents were in the same position. So 
There is a result which says that for a whole class of different kinds of control laws acting on a kinematic point models for the agents, uh, each trajectory uh, in the state space starting outside of the collinear region uh, converges exponentially fast to a finite limit in the target set. Whether the triangle to which the trajectory converges is right or left oriented depends on initial conditions. And the paper which I'm just summarizing the results now because this is not the main topic for the talk. Uh, the paper which does all this uh, is uh, appeared about three or four years ago in this journal if you're interested in seeing it. Now even though the results are for kinematic point models and for uh, certain, certain control laws, we have every reason to believe that this is a general result. It doesn't, it's going to, yes? Yes, there are arrows on the triangle. Yeah, only in one direction. Though. There's no algorithm. The algorithm is not. No, no, algorithm is the spanning tree in the desert. Spanning tree. They're closed cycles. There's no trees. Okay. I can't see the. Okay. Sorry. Maybe somebody could. Uh, it's possible to. The slides are not all black, so that, that should help. Yeah, okay. Okay, so here, here's a uh, simulation. Uh, these were done by Ming Chao. This is, uh, those arrows show the force acting on the uh, agents in the plane. And sure enough, this is a MATLAB simulation. Sure enough, they go into formation. Uh, Next slide shows a simulation where the three agents start together in a straight line. And it turns out that such formations live in an invariant set. You can't escape the straight line. So that's the bad starting points. This is for your given control. Yes, yeah, but I, as I said before, I think if you change the control, you're not going to change the results very much. Uh, because it's exponential stability, it, well, this, you'd kick it off this line, but if you have exponential stability, so that's no, not noise immune, but it noise uh, has muscle that can fight, fight against noise. I'll say something more about the importance of exponential stability a little later in the talk. I think it's something that people don't really appreciate. Okay, so the story is pretty, it's, I think the results that exist are about as good as they can get, at least for kinematic point models. And so what do you do next? What's the next step? So the next step might be to try to work with two triangles. But guess what? Uh, immediately we're up against a large stone wall. It's uh, recently been shown by Ali Balabas that this formation is not stabilizable, at least with decentralized design. Um, I also can't see anything. Um, in fact, at present, there is no comprehensive stability theory for directed formations which have cycles. So the bad news is that beyond tri single triangles, people don't know very much. And it's not for want of trying. People have tried very hard to extend the results, but they're extremely difficult. Now, for the cycle-free formations, okay. So, Well, if it's completely. Yeah, but the whole idea is you don't want a completely. A, a want a connected, for a, a complete. A, you mean a, a. Yeah, complete graph. You don't want that because that's too much communication between agents. Well, I, I. I. I don't know. A lot of things have been tried, but so far there's no. So no general success. OK, so if we talk about acyclic formations, the situation improves dramatically. So let's suppose, uh, make the assumption that each agent has two co-leaders. That means 
at most two co-leaders. It means uh, I'm talking about a formation without cycles, which has in addition the constraint that each agent is tasked with following it most two other agents. Each, based on that, uh, these top two statements, uh, the word minimal, uh, minimally, in, min in talking about rigid formation, a minimally rigid formation is one which loses rigidity if you take away a maintenance link. So it's no redundancy. So for minimally rigid formations, which has this uh, constraint about two co-leaders, one can prove that uh, um, each, uh, each ha such formations has a unique leader, which has uh, a vertex which is out degree zero. And we'll call that leader agent one. A unique first follower, which has an out degree of one, and we'll call that agent two. And all the other agents in the formation must have uh, degree two, exactly two. That means they must be tasked with following two co-leaders. This is a consequence only of the top two lines of the slide. Uh, we can generate such a formation by a sequence of something called vertex additions, uh, starting with uh, two agent formation consisting of agents one and two, and I'll illustrate this in a minute. The orientation and position of such a formation is determined by the leader and the first follower. The leader is in some position, the first follower is can only following the leader and he has to maintain a distance, so all he can do is go around in a circle. That's all his allowable positions are. And once he fixes his position uh, and all other agents are following two agents, uh, the entire formation is fixed in position. So leader and first follower really call the shots. This, formations of this type are known to be locally stabilizable, assuming the leader and first follower are fixed in position. This is work by John Bellio and his student. Uh, which is in the 2003 CDC. Uh, and more recently, it was shown to be globally stabilizable by a 2008 CDC paper. So how do you build a directed, acyclic, minimally rigid formation? So you start out with, by specifying the leader and the first follower, agents one and two, and the next step is to do what's called the vertex addition. Some of you have, may have heard of Henneberg sequences. Henneberg was a mathematician who lived at the beginning of the, 19th, of the 20th century, and um, uh, he was concerned with how you build rigid frame, frameworks or formations, uh, starting with almost nothing. And the, uh, there's two kinds of operations that one can perform. Uh, the vertex addition is one, I'll explain that in a second, and the other one is uh, edge splitting. Uh, and there's a whole literature on this, and it's uh, very important, big results, only valid in two-dimensional space, though. In three space, his results begin to fall apart. Okay, so this is the leader, the first follower. Now I'm going to do a vertex addition. I just did it. So I've, with two more distances specified, uh, I then add a third vertex and arrows to agents one and two. But keep in mind, and just specifying those distances does not uniquely determine the position of agent three. Agent three could also be over here and still satisfy the distance. Point is that there are two, in the plane, there are two possible configurations uh, for the given distances. Now we could add another, another uh, uh, vertex and we still have, we still have all the, we still have the rigidity that, and, and acyclicity that we require, and one can continue this way. And for in each step, there are two choices, two positions. So you can start to figure out how many possible formations you can build this way. Let's first briefly talk about the control of the first follower. This is. It's a requirement of uh, based on the assumptions that were made uh, several slides ago. The, requirement of minimal rigidity and that each agent has is tasked to follow it most two others. Yeah, Just those two. Right, um, that's that's what why minimal rigidity? One and two. Well though that's a consequence. That one that, that two follows one is a consequence of the assumptions that were made. 
Um, so one can ask the question, how do you build a control which causes agent two to follow agent one at a target resistance D12? Uh, so let's look at the picture. So there, Y1 and Y2 are the, vec uh, the position vectors of the two agents. And let's suppose that Y2 is, has a kinematic point model. So Y2, keep in mind, is a two-component vector because it's in two-dimensional space. So here's the control without motivation. Turns out it's a kind of a gradient mm -hmm. control uh, that I want to talk about. If you apply that to the system, you get a uh, closed loop that looks like this. And then you can, uh, you can prove the following uh, result. You can say that if Y1 and Y2, uh, if the initial values of the two agents are not the, s the initial positions of the two agents are not the same, and if, y if the velocity of, y1 go y1 of agent 1 goes to 0 exponentially fast, and in, in addition, if Y1 has a L1 norm, which is sufficiently small, then in fact this control will cause agent 2 to go to the correct position in relationship to agent one. So you can see already, because of all these ifs, that this, yeah, this is not completely trivial, doing even something as simple as this. OK. Uh, this is in the, uh, this particular fact is proved in a uh, short paper in the uh, last, in the IFAC Congress 2012. Somebody needs to be giving you Y2. Uh, Y2 agent 2 needs to know the position of agent 1. The re it's the relative position of agent 1. That's correct. Yes. 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 Right. And the theory that exists now is, assumes the leader stops. So it's an interesting question which has not been pursued. Probably can do something with it, with the agent leader moving to a, a constant velocity. That would be a fun bit problem. I think we looked at that a little bit, but not so much. Okay, so now we're in, I'm going to talk about the other situation when you have an agent and who is tasked to follow two co-leaders. What kind of control law would you use? This turns out to be a little more tricky than you might think. So let me just state the technical results. So there are two maps, two functions, tau and red tau, uh, depending upon uh, target distances, such that um, Tau of uh, so there's some various formulas here. I think it's easy to look at a picture. Uh, supposing zj and zk are the um, positions of the leaders that agent uh, I is to follow. So if the target distances are dij and djk, uh, dij and dik, there are two such positions. Uh, which uh, satisfy the distance constraints. And they're shown in red and they're shown in blue. And the, these distances are functions, of course, of the positions of Z, J, of, of agents J and K. And that's why we have these two functions here. But notice that this, these particular formulas where they give you the right distance are only valid when the distance between Z, J, and Z are satisfy these inequalities. What we want are functions which are valid in the whole plane. Now it is possible, and I'll show you how we build such functions, but they're not continuous. They're discontinuous functions. And since we're going to stick them in differential equations, at least on first pass, that's going to be a problem. Those of you who've worried about solving differential equations know that when you have discontinuities, you have existence questions. However, the good news is that even though these functions, which I'm about to define, are not continuous on the whole plane, when you multiply them by these norms, they are. And these, this is actually what's going to go into the differential equation. And this is the uh, effect of putting uh, such a control law into the differential equation using, uh, using one of the functions. You can't use both. You have to use one or use the other. and that says you're either specifying that you want to be in this position or in this position. You obviously can't be in both. Here's the other, here's the other uh, differential equation you would get if you specified using the second control. Well, we're going to stay with just one. Now, I want, to give, I want to give you the full picture of what these 
target points, as, as we call what these functions look like. So the th this, this, what we have to do is to break the space of positions of agents, of the leader agents, into two, into regions. So there's one region specified on the left, which satisfies this, the second region which satisfies this, and the third possible region which satisfies this. So for the situation on the left, uh, that corresponds to the two leaders being positioned like this, and the distance is giving you a picture like this. In this case, the target point is chosen to be on the boundary right here. Similarly, uh, in this particular situation, we have a configuration that looks like this. In this case, the target point is chosen to be on the boundary here, determined by the line between these two points. It turns out that you can analytically describe these uh, points uh, by a formula that looks like this. It's not hard to see. The third po possible situation is this one, in which case uh, there are two possible points that one could choose to define the function tau to complete its definition. And obviously, you can only choose one. So we'll, for the, let's say we choose this one. Uh, this car is actually this one. This corresponds to this formula. Now, notice this formula has sines and cosines, and so it's getting messy already. It is possible to, to eliminate. What? The one I couldn't understand what you said. Yeah, yeah, it is. Of course, that's exactly what it's doing. It's doing it's doing the uh, rotation. So it is possible to, ex to eliminate the sines and cosines and to write this analytically like this, uh, where S is given by this formula. So that's not terribly important. What is important is that there is a well-defined function tau, which, which, which is applicable to all points in the plane, all leader points, y, yj and yk. Tau is not a continuous function. I doubt there is a continuous function which could, could uh, have these properties. Uh, but uh, when it's used in the differential equation, it's multiplied by a norm squared of something, and the product is continuous. So sidestepping uniqueness issues, which are probably not important here, at least we know the differential equations have a solution, so we're not in never-never land. We have a, f a function for which you can make statements. Now you can show that if the two leaders, this is important because we're just talking about two, two leaders and one follower now. We're not talking about a whole formation. If the two leaders move exponentially fast to some positions, yi star and yk star, then uh, the follower agent moves exponentially fast to yi star, which is in fact given by uh, the target point formula. So this does what it's supposed to do. So to, so let me now generalize this for more than two agents. First of all, for more than two agents and a given set of desired distances, now in a big formation, there are two to the n minus two possible formations consistent with the distant constraints. That's because of this ambiguity that I mentioned before. So, but you can pick at each step in the design process, you can pick one and so you can get everything that you need. So the two to the n minus two target point controls for the n agents, one for each possible formation. Once the target point cons controls are chosen, exponential conversions to the corresponding formation will occur, provided the leader and co-leader start in different positions, the leader's velocity converges to zero exponentially fast, and the leader's velocity is sufficiently small L1 norm. So for, for example, if the leader was standing still, uh, one would get convergence. Yeah, the initial value. Yeah, initial I meant the, uh, the no. The norm is the L1 norm. See, L, the L1 norm is the, the is the velocity. It's the velocity of, of from zero to infinity. It's 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 the. I suppose you could you could start the algorithm uh, after it came to rest, and then you would have a zero norm if that's what you did. 
So here's, here are two uh, simulations. Uh, the red agent is the leader. Why it's not working is, okay. Uh, it's kind of slow, and those arrows uh, indicate who's looking at who. So there are two, Agent Blue is looking at Agent Green and Agent Red. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Agent Black is looking at Agent Yellow and Agent Blue. Uh, the the co-leader, if the leader is red, the first co-leader, uh, first follower is green. And that's what happens, so you can run a simulation. Here's another example which goes beyond the theory is perhaps more what you would like to see. Uh, the agents move into a, a V formation and maintain it, and the formation keeps moving, but that the theory doesn't at present allow for the leader to keep moving. So the results here are, are not complete, they're, uh, uh, but they're about as good as that exist in the literature right now. So if I'm, if I'm conveying to you that these problems are more challenging than you might first expect, you're right, they are. These are hard problems. If you miss what? I don't know. If you lose that information, you'd be in trouble. Uh, you might hit. You might hit your neighbor and hurt him. If you lo you mean if you lose uh, if you lose knowledge of where you where your neighbors are, I, I think that's a practical problem. That's like that's like saying you don't you you can't see the car in front of you. Excuse me. How often do you need to know that? Uh, the way this problem is set up, you need to know it on a continuous basis. But I can imagine uh, cha that what you're asking is can it change the problem and sample it, for example? Yeah, probably, probably. That's not been studied. Well, why, why does this this what is what? In three dimensions. Actually, this problem, I don't believe this one's been looked at in three dimensions. The next problem I'm going to talk about has been. Some of the problems have gone into 3D, some haven't. That adds an additional degree of complexity. But, uh, yeah, I think so. I think this, I actually think this would, uh, this particular work would go into 3D without any trouble. That's my guess. Well, no, they not. No, we don't have that at all. Not in this. No, no. I, you're thinking of flocking problems and things like that. It's a whole different thing. Okay. So, the, so this, I've, what I've described to you is pretty much uh, the state of the art. Uh, maybe it's not satisfactory. I don't know, but the state of the art in directed formation control. And you might ask. What's next? Well, we've already seen some questions come up from the audience which suggest research topics. There's a lot. One could, um, here I'll mention some others. One can talk about stabilization of directed formations with more than two cycles, or with cycles of cycle length later than, greater than three, in three dimensions, uh, with combined bearing and distance constraints. So there is a, there is a rigidity literature which involves not just uh, holding constant the distance between you and your neighbors, but also holding constant bearing. Some, I won't go into the details of that, but that also uh, uh, can be thought of as, as part of the uh, way of setting up a uh, rigidity-based formation control. And there is some work on this uh, bearing and distance constraint. There is a bit of a literature on that. One can also up the ante and, uh, and go uh, to more complicated models. So here we're talking about um, point models, so that isn't very realistic. We could go to non-holonomic and dynamic agent models. Things will get more complicated, but I expect the results will not change dramatically. The big question, of course, is collision avoidance. Uh, 
and that's one can worry about that. We haven't worried about it at all. Okay. Now I want to turn to what's actually the main topic for this talk, which is undirected formation control. But I felt like I had to give some background in directed formation control. And the message I've been trying to convey is that as far as directed formations are concerned, as attractive as the concept may be, the, the ideas have not been developed very much despite a number of years of trying. The problems turn out to be tough, real tough. A lot of papers, but the literature is not so satisfactory. Okay, so let me now tell you the difference between directed and undirected formations and where things are at in the undirected world. So let's suppose that we, again, I'm going to talk really exclusively about a triangle uh, simply because it's a whole lot, because things are complicated enough even with a triangle. I could go to two triangles, but I'm not going to. So I, need, I want to introduce a couple of concepts. First one is uh, there's, a there's an underlying graph, and you see it there. This is a, happens to be a complete graph on three vertices. And uh, I could label the vertices with three position vectors. And the object, uh, in the, and write x as a six-component vector, sometimes called a uh, multi-state. Uh, and then I could talk about the object consisting of the graph and the vector. And in the literature on rigidity theory, this is actually not called a formation. It's called a framework. Because the people who did rigidity were not concerned with formations. They were concerned with frames, the mechanical uh, uh, theory of structures and so forth. So that's the proper term. Now, one can associate with any framework of formation what I'll call an edge function. An edge function is just a function which looks at the distance squared uh, between each pair of uh, vertices for which there is an edge. Now, since this is a complete graph, uh, it's a little bit deceptive. If I had a, if I had a, a fourth uh, vertex, uh, then I might, uh, I would, and, and, an, and another triangle would be, uh, would, would appear, I would, I would add two more components to this vector not three. So an edge function only has to do with distance squared associated with the edges of the graph. Let's suppose, I'm going to just get a little terminology down, let's suppose that n is the number of agents that I'm talking about, and m is the number of edges. Rigid motion means the distance between all pairs of motions, all pairs of points remain constant as this thing moves. And we say that a formation, this is not a, not What? The, the rigid motion means that the, dis, the distances are all constant. They don't have to be the same distance. No, no, no. So there's a technical term called infinitesimal rigidity. It's not my choice of terminology, but that's what exists. And roughly speaking, this is not exactly right. It says that uh, a formation is infinitesimally rigid if rigid motion is the only kind of motion which can occur along any continuous path for x. And that's com not completely right. It turns out that rigidity is more of a subtle issue because there are all these really weird exceptional cases. Uh, a precise definition of infinitesimal rigidity we'll, we'll give you in a second. There's something called a rigidity matrix. It's an m by 2n matrix. And it appears when you take the derivative of the edge function and, um, it, and you do partial uh, differentiation. So you see r appearing in the formula. Now, there is the notion I want to, the correct definition in infinitesimal rigidity is that a, forma a formation that's for fixed x is said to be is defined to be infinitesimally rigid if the rank of this matrix is maximal. And the maximal rank can be uh, maximal with respect to, there's, there's some limits on how large this rank can be. That three comes about because the three degrees of freedom in two dimensional space, there's a, there's a translation which is two degrees and a rotation which is a third degree. So if you go, if you go through the mathematics of this, you find that there is a, the kernel or null space of R has to have dimension 3, and so the rank has to be 2n minus 3. 
In any event, this is the definition of infinitesimal rigidity. And you're, let me just say this. Your favorite notion of rigidity, uh, the, here sits your favorite notion of rigidity, the intuitive notion. Here sits infinitesimal rigidity. If you have infinitesimal rigidity, it implies rigidity. But there are examples of rigid structures which are not infinitesimally rigid, but they are weird. So we'll deal only with infinitesimally rigid because at least there's an analytic description. Okay, so now with that background, let me go forward with the uh, problem I want to study. So here again is the uh, triangle with three target distances. And as I said before, directed formation is one in which the distance between each pair of neighboring agents is maintained by just one of the two. So in this case, agent one is tasked with the problem of maintaining the distance D1. And as I've just pointed out, the theory of directed formation is not so well developed. Undirected formation, the distance between each pair of neighboring coins is maintained by both of them. So this says that both agents one and agents two build control laws which try to maintain the distance D1. The good news about this is that there is a fairly well-developed general theory of undirected formation control based on kinematic point models, in fact, using potential function to come up with the control laws. And this work was done uh, some years ago by Laura Crick, uh, Brush, and Bruce Francis at the University of Toronto. It's a nice piece of work. It was Laura's, I think, her thesis, master's thesis, actually. Uh, a fairly complicated development, but the fact that, they, that one could act, write down principles which apply to a large class of formations in, uh, with as many agents as you want is nice, and it's, it sort of stands as a shining example of what you can do with rigidity theory up to now. So we got interested in this a few years ago. Um, there are, oh, one of the things that, the, uh, that these three authors managed to do was to show, was to establish asymptotic stability. They were able to show that if you start with a bunch of points in the plane and you follow their control laws, asymptotically they'll converge to desired target formation, but not exponentially. So the question we so uh, it, the question we ask is what happens in such a formation if two neighboring agents have slightly different understanding of what the desired distance is supposed to be? In other words, supposing agent one and agent two don't both exactly know D one. Maybe agent two knows what D one is supposed to be, and agent two knows D one plus point oh 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 five. What happens? Now, if you don't like that, if you say, oh, I don't know, quantize everything, there are all kinds of ideas that people have proposed. So I'll, I'll ask another question. What happens if two neighbor agents have slightly different estimates of what the actual distance between them is? That's a practical question. It turns out the two questions are mathematically equivalent. So, so if I answer one, I'm answering the other. So it's a little easier to think about this in terms of the question at the bottom of the slide. No. Yes. Probably, yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's to 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 amplify on this a little bit. Supposing that Asian one uh, thinks the target distance are D one and D three bar. I guess we don't need the bar if I'm using colors, but uh, just say D three, which is a slightly different than uh, blue D three is slightly different than red D three. So that means that agent one has to use D1 and D3 blue to ma ma build this formation. Similarly, agent two has to use D2 and D1 blue and so forth for agent three. So, okay. Let's suppose again kinematic point models. And let me, because I, I'm gonna define some vectors because I wanna write down control laws. 
So these are relative position vectors. And I'm going to define some errors. Notice that if these errors were zero, then the agents would be in target positions. But I have to define another set of errors because not everybody is fortunate enough to know the red distance, all the red distances. So there have to be errors defined in terms of the blue distances, too. So agent one would normally like to be using E1 and E3, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know the right value of the build E3. He would need to know D3, but he only knows D3 bar. So instead of using E3, he has to use E3 bar. So that's what his control law looks like. And I'll tell you where these control laws come from in a second. So the control laws are not exactly the ones that one would want. And similarly for agent two and agent three. What it, let's define what I'll, what's called the mismatch error, which is the difference between D1 squared and D1 bar squared. Same with two and three. It's then possible to write the errors which we really don't want in terms of the errors, original errors and the mismatch errors. And then if you apply the differential equations, apply the, the contr these controls to the differential equations, this is what the dynamical system looks like. So the effect of the mismatch errors becomes uh, additive terms multiplying these uh, linear functions of state. Now, I promise to tell you where these control laws come from. Now, you understand. Yeah, they're assuming they're fixed. Now, the, in the case when the mu's are all zero, which is the case that Francis and colleagues worked on, he used this potential function and simply set xi dot equals the negative, uh, the gradient of the uh, of potential function with respect to xi. And um, this, these are the control laws that one gets it, with mu equals zero. Of course, we're not looking, we're looking at the perturbed situation when there are non-zero mu's. Okay, now I'm going to stop and ask the audience, if anybody knows the answer to the question I'm about to ask because you've heard this before, please don't answer now. The rest of you can answer. So here we have a triangle. On it, we have three red target distances and slightly different, you notice they're very slightly different, three blue target distances. And my question to you is, what happens when I run the simulation? What do you think is going to happen? Something's going to happen. Steady state error, finite. Steady state error. Finite steady state error. That's one answer. Any other answers? Something like a dog kidney. Like that, like a what? Like a dog kidney with one tail. Yeah. And what what would that what would that entail in the way of motion? Anything? Yeah, but what would the form what would the formation be doing? No oscillating around the point. Oscillating around the point. So like this? couldn't decide what it wants to do, so it keeps going like this. Okay. Well, we didn't know either, for sure. Although I must say that the intuition was like the last fellow who just said something. You know, you know, if you have two agents disagreeing on, on what the distance is, there's going to be some kind of back and forth something, but we didn't know what it was. So what we did was we ran a simulation, and that's what happened. And we had no idea what was going on. Absolutely no idea why this was happening. We were very surprised. And the, the three, one of the other people working on this at the time, this was at Yale. Uh, one of the other people was Brian Anderson, who I think many of you know about. He's a pretty smart guy. He had no idea. No idea what was going on. So I said, oh, this is some kind of a special property of, to do with triangles. So it's a single triangle. So, okay, we'll try it with two triangles. Because the uh, lower, of course, the Crick Francis controls up, can be applied to two triangles. So we put a mismatch error in and we ran a simulation. Same thing again. 
that we didn't even know for sure this looks like a closed orbit. The problem is you, you cannot decide whether or not you have a closed orbit but from simulation because if you go out and you have a hamburger and you come back, it may blow up or it may spiral down to zero. You don't know. Or it might take a week or it might take a month or it might take a thousand years. You just don't know. You have to analyze it. So the first thing we did was... Well, you can think of limit cycle. You could, you know, there are all kinds of things. You could think of bifurcations and uh, Poincaré, Bendix theory. There were a lot of things that we started uh, worrying about. But before we did that, we said, wait a minute, let, let's see what happens in three dimensions. Because the Crick Francis thing works in three dimensions. So we, that, that, what you're seeing is a two dimensional representation of a 3D simulation, and this is a tetrahedron. And all of a sudden, we see a slightly different behavior. We see rotation, but we also see what looks like translation. In fact, what it looks like is a helix. So we have all these clues, but we didn't know what was going on. And so what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about this, but I worry about my time because it's already 11 o'clock. All right. Okay. Okay. What if you had done something slightly different? Every once in a while, I communicate with you. Well, I don't know. I mean, if you, you, you change the... I, I, at the end of the talk... Uh, what do you do in places that are implicit communication with them? I have some mind model of what you are, but what if I explicit... Well, there, there, are, there are a lot of possibilities, but we don't know. We, we, what we do know is that most of, the, most of the things that we use to try to fix the problem, which is what you're talking about, uh, we're unsuccessful except for one, and I'll, and I'll say, but there's open research there. There are some people in this room I know who like adaptive control, so you'll like what's, what's I'm going to say at the end of the talk. And uh, uh, So there, there is some progress in, in getting around this problem. But first, it's trying to understand what the problem is. So here, this is the equations of motion. Um, I'm not going to completely go th through this because it does get technical and, of course, it's uh, I've been talking for an hour and I don't want to put everybody to sleep. Okay, I'm just, I'm just reviewing the equations which we, which we have to analyze. Those are the error equations. These are the Z equations. Um, and if you look at one of the facts that we need is that Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 equals zero. And um, let me just say right now, uh, Make some, uh, tell you some recent, very recent history. This particular fact uh, fails to be true if one looks at more complicated formations with more than three agents. And um, as a result, the results that I'm talking about now, although they generalize, the generalization is considerably more difficult. And I'll try to hint to what the generalizations are. Uh, as, I, as I go along. Okay, so if I take the mismatch errors and arrange them in a vector, and take x and arrange it in a six-component vector, then you see that I have a self-contained differential equation describing the system with a perdu constant perturbation u. I can also write down the different, you don't have to worry about the details of these equations. Uh, I can also differentiate the three z vectors and get a what looks like a second dynamical system. Notice that the e's are functions of the z's. So this actually is a self-contained dynamical system. The right-hand side, in other words, is just a function of z's and u's. It's kind of interesting with two systems, even though we started with one. And we're on a roll, so let's take a look at a third system. That's the second self-contained system. I can take, write down differential equations for the E's, and if you look at the right-hand side of those equations, mu's appear, but they're constants, but they're all these Z's. Can we write the third differential equations as a self-contained system just depending upon E's? And uh, notice that there's a suggestion that we might be able to, because I could take this formula, 
solve it for E squared and get rid of, the, get rid of at least these terms and get them just in terms of E's. But what about these freaking cross terms? So I want to say something about that. So first of all, I can get rid of the, as I said, I can get rid of the Z squared terms. But now I can play a little game. I, it, just using an expansion, Z I plus Z J, uh, this is you know, elementary algebra. I can expand that out like this. And now I use this formula, which I said is special, in, but it applies in this case, to get rid of this term and write that and solve for this and I get that the cross term is equal to a function of just zi of norms of zi squared so I can substitute in e's and get this in sure enough to be just the function of e's. So if I write e as a vector I indeed have a third self-contained uh, dynamical system, which we call the error system. This particular fact generalizes, but not globally. And by that I mean it is possible to write, to develop an error system like this, but it only holds for values of x in certain regions of the state space. I'll say more about that later. Also, first I want to tell you why, why do we care about the existence of an error system? Z equations? Yes, it would be the Z equations. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Okay, so the first thing that one so here's here's the way this this uh, system is analyzed. The first thing we want to do is to show that if the errors are sufficiently small to begin with, and if the perturbations mu are also small and, non, and, and generic, excluding some exceptional values, then E will actually converge to constant values. We can show that first thing. That's a, ultimately, that's a stability result. And in order to prove stability of things, contrary to some percentage of the literature in adaptive control, you need, and you can use the Kunov theory, you need self-contained systems. So in order to apply the Kunov theory to the E system, it has to be a self-contained system. And the claim is that if we look at the, first thing we do is we look at the system without perturbation. So we set mu equals zero we prove, can prove that E equals zero is an exponential, locally exponentially stable e equilibrium. And to do this using the Puma theory, and I have some slides on this, but I'll zip through those. Exponential stability is real important. Why? Because exponentially stable systems are robust. That means if this system is exponentially stable, this system will also be exponentially stable, provided you is sufficiently small. If the equilibrium will move. It may not be the zero vector anymore, but it'll still be exponentially stable. Um, you can prove that using the uh, inverse function theorem, or you can look in uh, Khalil's book, where he comes up with more complicated proof of the same statement. But anyway, the key point is exponential stability is a robust property. To get exponential stability in the first place using the Punov theory, you need a self-contained system. So we need a self-contained error system. Once you've got that in hand, you can conclude what we want to conclude, which is the perturbed system is also exponent locally exponentially stable. That means that if the error starts out close to zero, it converges to zero. Uh, the fact that it converges exponentially fast is less important. The fact, the fact is that it converges to zero. And why would you say that that's important? I'll explain in a second. I'm going to go through this fast because I don't think you need to see this stuff. Okay, this is the result. There exists an open ball about E equals zero in, in um, three-dimensional 
space, because V is the three-component vector, and a vector Q, which depends continuously on U, such that when U is equal to zero, such that, that Q of zero equals zero, and for every value of mu in the ball, Q of mu is an exponentially stable equilibrium of the perturbed system. Um, proving this result, re after making a significant error on my part, I sat for a year. Straightening out the error occupied the full and undivided attention of five people this past December at Yale, including Brian Anderson, and uh, I don't know if any of you know Ali Balabas, the University of Illinois, is good in differential geometry. It took a lot of pain to straighten this all out, but we did in the, for higher dimensional systems. Okay, so why is this, why care about this? Supposing that we, we, the error system goes to equilibrium. Then the next thing, notice, that immediately tells us something about the Z's. It says the, Z, the, the norm squared of the Z's. The Z's are bounded. Their norm squareds are constants. So we're immediately picking up information. But that's not all. You see the ads on television. That's not all. There's more. Look at the differential equations uh, for the Z variables. First thing we know is their norms are square, but that doesn't tell us, tells us something about the Z variables, but not everything. But now look at the differential equations for the Zs, and you notice that if the E's are constant, we have a constant coefficient linear differential equation. All of a sudden. Linear time invariant differential equation. So think about it. What kinds of behaviors could the Z's have if they are solutions to time invariant linear differential equations with constant norms? What possibly could they be? What can linear differential equations produce in the way of signals? Only exponentials, right? So it can't be decaying exponentials because the norms are constant. It can't be growing exponentials. The only possibility is exponentials, sinusoids, or constants. Those are the only possibilities. Right? So immediately we're starting to get some clues. Once the errors go to zero, we know that the z's are either going to be constants or they're going to be varying sinusoidally. And that's the beginning of explaining this circular behavior. Okay, now let me, uh, on, that, on that line, let me make a statement. Um, uh, it turns out the z dots are not necessarily equal to zero. The z's are not constants necessarily. We want to rule out, to understand this behavior, we want to rule out the possibility that the z variables are constants. And there was a claim, which I'm not going to, it was very easy to prove. Uh, the claim is, suppose the error system is in equilibrium and that z dot is equal to zero then either the rank of this matrix Z1, Z2 is less than 2, or the sum of the mu's is equal to 0. Now, the, interpret the result. To say that the rank of the matrix Z1, Z2 is less than 0, that's an elementary, uh, it's elementary that that means that the three agents are in a line. That's, that's another way of saying that the three agents are collinear. So, to, to interpret this statement, if disease go to constant values, either the agents are in a line, or the sum of the uh, or the three um, mismatch errors satisfy an algebraic equation. Of course, this algebraic equation is non-generic. Almost any choice of mu one, mu two, and mu three will fail to satisfy this differential equation this algebraic equation. So if we say, okay, we're going to have mismatch error, but it's going to be, it's going to be uh, generic, then it can't satisfy mu1 plus mu2 plus mu3 equals zero. And if we're in a situation 
uh, if the E's are zero, think about what it means for the E's to be equal to zero. If the E's are equal to zero, it means that the, di that the target distances are more or less the right values. If the target distances are more or less the right values, the three agents can't be in a line except for some stupid formulations of the problem. So you can't have, you can't have this, and you can't have this generically. So Z dot is non-zero generically, which is the statement that we want. Um, I'm not going to, so I'm not going to go through any more of the analysis of this, but using this fact and a little bit more analysis, one can show One, one ends up is, I'm, I'm going fast, but maybe I'm being a little unfair to you. I really don't want to carry you through this. This slide explains how we use the fact that Z dot is non-constant to conclude that there, that there is a matrix which is skew-symmetric, two, two by two skew-symmetric matrix, which can't be the zero matrix, so it must have a pair of imaginary eigenvalues, and those are the eigenvalues. So in fact, the formation is actually going at a single sinusoidal frequency around in a circle. And in fact, uh, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. So I'm, I'm so Brian Anderson, if you know him at all, you know he's, he's a real tiger. He, he sits down, he computes, he's just like a fullback in a football team, he goes right at a problem, right at a wall, it'll knock it over if it's not too thick. And so, what? Yeah, every year, every year. Yeah, I will. In fact, he's coming in, uh, sure, he's, com he's coming in late June before the American Patrol Conference. So if you want to have him, I'm sure he'd be delighted to visit. Um, <laughs> True, correct, <laughs> correct. No, they play rugby, I think. They, they play something, some kind of weird thing, you know. Yeah, they were a commonwealth country, so, yeah. Okay, so, so you have to take my word for it because of time. I don't want to go the label this, um, the end result is that uh, the formation goes, in, goes into a circular orbit and uh, remains in a circular orbit forever. Uh, we tried to use Poincaré Bendixson theory and that uh, was unsuccessful. That was our first attempt at proving this. So in the end, this is, takes a little work, but it's largely just linear systems. That's the only reason I can do it. All right, so um, let me go on to the last part of the talk, which uh, I think will interest some people here. So how do you fix this, no, this robustness problem? So the various suggestions have been made. Oh, somebody says, oh, introduce delays. Well, our simulations don't seem to suggest that uh, delays are going to do any good. Uh, there are people in the world who like dead, dead zones. There are people in adaptive control who like dead zones. I don't like them. It's kind of a non-elegant way of doing anything changes the problem, so we didn't pursue dead zones. Uh, quantization is another possibility, and I'm not even sure if you, one thinks this through, that it would deal with the problem, particularly when, you, because you have to send, because of the, one of the things that can cause mismatch is the uh, missensing of uh, actual positions of, of agents. Uh, there's something called reorientation, I'm not going to go through that. This is also only partially successful, and there's some <coughs> results in the last ACC on this. What I do want to talk about is cancellation. So what is cancellation all about? And this idea was developed by uh, Ming Chao, in, uh, who was at the University of Groningen, and he just, uh, he now has a paper which is uh, about to appear in some uh, robotics journal. And this is this is really, Ming was my student, and Ming uh, had some exposure to adaptive control because I had some interest in that. 
And it was his thinking in adaptive control which led to this idea, which is pretty, uh, it was pretty surprising that he could have any success at all. So let me write down the equations again. Uh, these are the equations we've seen before. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, this, nothing new here. These are all on previous slides. The mismatch errors appear in the control laws. So, Ming said, let's try to cancel the mismatch errors, which is what you do in, in adaptive control. Let's just try to cancel them adaptively. It's interesting. Excuse me? It's interesting me. Well, I, there's, there's, no, there's no communication, any more, any, any increase in communication to do this. It's, this is done, it's not done that way. So let, let, uh, <coughs> let me change the control law. So in, these are the control laws which we did, which I did talk about. These are the new control laws, they're called the Ming's control laws, and notice that they have additional terms which are added to the control laws in order to, in, in the hopes of canceling the mismatch errors, which we don't know. So the idea is to try to figure out a way to adjust these terms, some people would call these parameter estimation terms, uh, using some kind of controls which, are, which I won't specify yet. So if you do that, then the, the, um, and you manipulate the equations, the new errors take on this form. And I'm going to define three outputs signals. These are signals which can be measured. Agent 1 can measure. Agent 1 knows mu 3. I mean, the indices are a little goofy, but Agent 1 knows the data y1. Agent 2 knows this data. Agent 3 knows this data. So we think of these as outputs to some system. In reality, they think of one of them. We think of what? I can't understand the word. Everybody will be what? Every agent. In your case, it's very specific. Where I know one, one number exactly, the other number is wrong, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, eight, so the, the numbers mu1, mu2, and mu3 are not known. Right. They're unknowns. But mu1, mu2, mu3 are exact. Yeah. They're, 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 yeah, but this gen that generalizes. That's, that's, that's not limited to triangle. That's true in general. Agent 1 knows 0, 1. I, I'm, I'm, E1 was the distance between 1 and 2, right? No, E1, uh, E1 is, the, is the error between the, um, between the actual distance between 1 and 2 and the target distance between Yeah, but I, wait, the, the in ra reality bothers me. This is reality. I, I, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, exactly yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so as things stand, these these quantities, the agents know y one, y two, and y three. Um, and I'm, as is common in adaptive control, I'll introduce parameter errors rather than I'll write the equations in terms of parameter errors. And since the mu's are constant, uh, these equations become these equations. Uh, I can also write these controls in terms of parameter errors, and they become this. Um, I can also write y1, y2, and y3 in terms of parameter errors. So everything can be written in terms of parameter errors. This is just to formulate the problem. The differential equations 
but the system can be written in terms of parameter errors. And of course, we have differential equations for the parameter errors. Um, okay. So, why did I put down the E? So, um, the differential equations for the E's are were of this form, are of this form. And if you put it all together, introduce them, there's a lot of notation here, introducing the couple of matrices, you end up with um, a differential equation for the errors can be written in this form, where R is this matrix and T is this matrix. And the uh, control law is that one set of control laws which are proposed uh, which were proposed in study, which do are restricted to triangles, are these. And they give rise to the second set of differential equations. And then one tries to analyze the system. And one can indeed show, this is a paper which was, which you can read, uh, I think it's the last CDC. One can show that uh, using this uh, Lupunov function, uh, that Indeed, uh, in the case of a triangle, that the uh, uh, parameters do go to zero. I guess I'm, I'm jumping over a great deal of stuff. Um, one of the things which, but, th but much of this research is open and unresolved. And the complexity, this is not straightforward application of ideas in adaptive control because the, the, this, because the decentralization constraint. Each agent only knows certain things. And so there's a limit on what kinds of control laws each agent can be asked to implement. Uh, so there are two papers on this. I, sorry, I thought I had the reference here, but I don't. I have the papers with me. One paper is the one by uh, Ming Chao, which is about to be published in a robotics journal. And the other one is a paper by my student, Xiaoxi Mu, which was, did appear in the recent CDC, and this is very much open research. It's, uh, it does look promising because there's been some degree of success with applying um, adaptive control kind of ideas to this problem. Uh, I also would say that, that another way of thinking about this problem is that, um, locally anyway, it looks very much like, or it is, uh, classical decentralized control problem, which was studied in the 1970s. Decentralized control for linear systems. You do a local linear analysis. The, equ the equations that ultimately need to be solved are dealt with are exactly the same as for uh, uh, classical decentralized uh, control problems. Some of you may know of the work that was done. It was a long time ago. It was work done by Ted Davison and guy named Wang, Chi Ho Wang, at Toronto, and also I have papers with a guy named um, John Pierre Korfman. These papers were written in the early 1970s. Uh, so this problem can be re reduced to that. The problem with all those results, the decentralized control, control results, is that the, the, the structure of the controllers that one comes up with, even though it's just linear systems, they're a real mess, a real big mess. That theory is not a, but that's not a settled subject. So I'm sorry that I uh, seem to go way over time and start covering things in a very um, quick way at the end. But let me conclude with uh, the. Definitely not. Definitely it is. But if you do, a, if there is a way to study it locally, which leads to a constant system. Here's why, it's a good, it's a good point. Even though it's a time-varying system, um, RR transposed really is a function of E, even though it doesn't look like it. And RT transpose is a function of E. Um, so the coefficient matrices are, are, are functions of E. And we know that, uh, wait a second, give me the reason in that codes. That, uh, ah, yeah. So what you do is you study this. You study 
the stability of the system for E equals zero, and you establish uh, uh, exponential stability of the equilibrium at E equals zero, now with mu and the mu is part of the equations. So we, with, with um, is it equals, E equals constant. Uh, and then you get a linear system. And then you use, and, and the, you get exponential stability of the linear system, and then you use robustness to move away from uh, E being equal to zero. That's sort of the idea from the literature. But in the 70s, the percent doesn't come from both sides of the linear Strictly. But, you, but those results can be used here because the, the thing that one wants to do is to establish exponential stability with E equals a constant. And then, and then use robustness to deal with E, not a constant. You know, establish exponential stability with E equals a constant, the problem reduces to a linear problem. Okay? I'm not sure which ones. The very major function of the blue and the red. Oh. way back. Yeah. Okay. Here you're basically making the assumption that one of them is not broken. One of them is what? Agent one which is D one and D three bar, right? Right. Yeah, but even it, but you see, um, but, but if I have D one bar and D three bar, yeah, but you see, yeah, but you, then I redefine D one bar to be D one. It, no, 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 it's no. the discrepancy between them which is where the trouble is. It doesn't matter if one of them knows. Okay. One, of, that, it's the it's the difference between them that's important. Okay, so it, it, it really doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. Matter. No, you just re, you just redefine, renormalize it. Okay. All right. So one of the one of the lessons here, I, I like to mention, so to conclude this, is that the Crick Francis result delivers asymptotic but not exponential stability. Asymptotic stability is not a robust, is not ro does not endow a system with robustness. That means that if you perturb a system, you are you always run the risk of getting unpleasant behavior. <coughs> and so when generalized this thinking, it occurred to me that there's, there's all kinds of distributed algorithms that people worry about. There are some dis distributed algorithms in which people share data, where agents share data. If they're sharing data and the data is real value, if it's, if it's, if it's uh, you know, discrete value, no problem. But if it's real value data, in all likelihood, they're not going to get have the same values. And if one doesn't have exponential stability or exponential conversion, something like that, you would expect that any algorithm is in some way going to misbehave. That's my point. Uh, that what this demonstrates is that there is a real risk in, and this is unique to distributed uh, control problems where there's shared data, of, of misbe misbehavior occurring when you don't have exponential convergence or exponential stability. Unfortunately, most all of nonlinear system theory does not deliver exponential stability. Thanks. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah, I, well, I, more, I, I, I verbalized them. Okay. I'm feeling sorry that Jakob is, is having trouble staying awake. I don't blame him. Go ahead. Yeah, well, that's, that's, I agree. That's more or less true. The, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I, I, I wouldn't go quite that far. The only one we know which seems to fix the problem at the moment is, is um, canceling the errors, if you want, you could put it out of adaptive control. Uh, people have asked, and I've given this talk before, people have asked, well, what happens, oh, I've got all kinds of questions. What happens if, um, if you don't use kinematic point models? My answer is I expect only, only worse. <laughs> you only, get, only get worse. What happens if the models are not the same? Only worse. The problem will be much harder to analyze, but only, it'll, it'll, I think these, this is a, a intrinsic problem uh, which has to do with, this, with the use of shared information, which is not the agents yeah. and, and, and the lack of that exponential stability. Or take steps to correct it, uh, to correct the discrepancies, and the directed is is or it presents other problems. We don't know what to do. Okay, so the, uh, Brian Anderson has, some, has a paper on that, using consensus uh, information control. I must say, I don't completely understand. He does have some things. I have several papers. Okay, okay. okay. So I, now, now the follow-up is that if we can establish consensus, then we can actually consciously generate topology, not the formation, yeah. from that consensus on, and we just have a paper on that. Okay. If I can follow on to what you're saying, I, I uh, there is, um, so you all know that people have, have beat the hell out of the consensus problem for Absolutely. 15 years. What really interests me, and I, this is an example of it, is the use of consensus with some other uh,